I left our shops in North Carolina and headed north to Roslyn, New York, to visit a man who knows more about the Vanderbilt Cup than anyone not named Vanderbilt. Howard Cropley, successful, retired businessman, obsessive compulsive car guy, just like the rest of us, and caretaker of the Black Beast. Howard. Hey, Ray. Good Welcome. to see you, man. Welcome thank to you the for Black your Beast. time. Oh, thank you. I can't wait to see it. Uh, it's going to be exciting. Oh, wow. Here's the Black Beast. Man, that thing is cool. It looks just like its pictures. You know, black with a white number, we had a guy with a black car with a white number. It was I number remember. three, though. He beat on us pretty good. <laughs> I, wow. I recall that. The Black Beast, a legendary hand-built race car and winner of the Vanderbilt Cup. Being from New Jersey, I felt so embarrassed when I realized that the first major motor race in the United States right. on the first course that was ever built specifically for cars was right here on Long Island, and I didn't know anything about it. It's the Vanderbilt Cup races. From 1904 to 1910, there were six major races held here on Long Island. And in 1904, it was the first major international road race ever held in the United States. It was like the Super Bowl of its day with hundreds of thousands of people coming out to see this. What would inspire a guy like William K. Vanderbilt Jr. to promote an auto race in 1904? Well, William K. Vanderbilt Jr., he was uh, really a pioneer in automobiles, and he had more money than you could ever dream of. He was the great-grandson of Cornelius Vanderbilt. He was the heir to the railroad fortune. But what his passion was was automobiles. He just loved automobiles. He loved going fast. He always had the fanciest cars, the fastest cars. He went to Europe when he was only like 24 years old, and he competed in some of the major city-to-city -city races there and did really well. He just saw the passion that the Europeans had for it, and he wanted to bring that passion and bring it back to the United States. And he wanted to show the American manufacturers they were missing the boat here by not making a better car. And so he brought over the best drivers, the best cars from Europe that compete against the American manufacturers to really try to encourage the American manufacturers to get a better car. Then in June of 1904, he challenged the Europeans to compete against the Americans in the Vanderbilt Cup race, and that's how it started. Beth Noir, does that mean... That's the I'm, Black I'll Beast. I'll kick your butt. That means Black Beast in it's French, Black right? Beast, right? That is awesome. Now, I understand that the engine in this is almost 600 cubic inches, is that 680 correct? cubic inches. 680 cubic inches. Six cylinder, it was one of the first six cylinder race cars. 680 cubic inches, wasn't there a cubic inch rule? There was, and they violated it. They did? <laughs> yes. So this was the first car that cheated on the engine side? That's exactly right. What was the rule? <laughs> the rule was 600. 600, and yes. this was 680? This was 680, yes. Was there a NASCAR inspection there? Uh, there wasn't. There was not? Yes, wow. so no penalties. The Black Beast had to use two chains to put the power of that 680 cubic inch engine to the ground. What kind of fuel did it run on? This ran on regular gasoline. Back then, the octane was about 65, so uh, right now we just take it regular gas. It runs great. Uh, it raced in 16 races, won six out of 16. And this car's got history not only in the Vanderbilt Cup, but it's got history at Indianapolis Motor Speedway. It did. It ran in the first Indy 500 in 1911 and was one of the favorites to win the race. It broke down, though, on the 53rd lap and finished 33rd. It broke on lap 53, and that's surprising because the Black Beast was built by Alco, a company that built locomotives that went millions of miles. Alco also built automobiles from 1906 to 1913, but soon decided the car business just wasn't profitable enough. Alco's young plant manager disagreed, and he started his own car company. His name, Walter P. Chrysler. There were four Alco racers eventually built for 1909 and 1910 Vanderbilt Cup races. This was the only Alco race car. And this was the showpiece for the Alco line of, of automobiles. So they use this as the showpiece to promote their, uh, their car lines. How long did it take to build a car back then? It took about six months, all by hand. Wow, so it was all hand, hand It was built. all hand built, the whole car was hand built. Hand built in the early 1900s didn't mean assembly. It meant every part had to be designed, forged, machined, or fabricated from raw materials, right down to the nuts and bolts. These cars were one-off works of art. Although built in America, the Black Beast was a world traveler. I was looking for a car of the era. I found, of all places, on the internet, this car was available in Brussels. Uh, on the internet? On the internet. So a car that was built when the telegraph was 
was popular, yes. you found on the internet. I found on the internet. When this car raced, it, it was actually manual fuel pump over there, as you can see. Oh, so it wow. took two people to drive the car. It was the driver and the mechanician. And the mechanician would sit here and just pump the fuel at intervals to get the, the fuel from the 30-gallon uh, tank into the engine. And did he have to maintain a pressure off of one of these gauges? Yes, he would be watching the gauges. Now, why did they call them machinations? That was uh, just the term that they used. It was really a driving mechanic. And in racing, until about the 1920s, it, it, there were always two people who were required to race in a car. The driver was always safe. They had the steering wheel. The driver knew they were going. The mechanician never knew where they were going to make a turn. And usually, if there was an injury or a fatality, it was the mechanician who, who, who really was the person who was in the most dangerous position. Turns out, fuel wasn't the only thing the mechanician was responsible for. Now you're telling me he's got to be putting oil in, too? Yeah, the, the mechanician was very busy during the race. Not only that, he acted as the navigator. So he would be looking back and forth while the driver was looking straight ahead. The mechanician was really the eyes and ears for the driver. So going back to the mechanician being the predecessor of the crew chief, sounds like the crew chief is probably more important than the driver. Definitely, definitely. That's what I've been saying Just like for years. Now. Just like now. <laughs> There's no way I would be riding with Gordon, especially if I didn't have brakes or a steering wheel. Right. And wooden wheels. Wooden wheels. You know. Totally wooden wheels. If they had wooden wheels when I was a crew chief, I would have shaved them and made them lighter. Did you ever do that? Uh, we never had to do faster? that. Too. How about balsa wood? You know, balsa wood goes a little that, faster because it's lighter. That would have would worked. That, that would have worked. What's that? That's the speedometer cable. This is connected to a 1907 speedometer, one of the first speedometers ever made. The gear system was actually a pretty ingenious way of measuring the speed of early race cars. Back in that day, 300 miles, how long would it take them to do that? They would do that about over four to five hours. So this was a very long race. The courses themselves uh, ranged anywhere from about 30 miles, and uh, towards the end, they, they shortened the course to about 15 miles. So that they would do multiple laps, about 10 to 12 laps of the race. We're talking cars like this. How fast would, would those guys actually go on the course? Well, uh, this car, when it won it in uh, 1909, averaged about 62 miles per hour. Average. Average. So uh, we're talking about at the curves and everything. So at, at top speed, it could reach 100 miles per hour. How could they keep them on the ground? Uh, in some cases, they didn't. The recorded speeds were much higher than I expected. They were daredevils. They were daredevils. Uh, extremely brave and courageous and really pioneers in the development of automobiles and parkways. How did the Black Beast handle at those speeds on the parkway? Well, I'm about to find out. I'm in Roslyn, New York, learning about the legendary Black Beast and how William K. Vanderbilt Jr.'s vision changed Long Island. <laughs> I don't think anybody could even know how big of an impact it had on the infrastructure of Long Island. This really promoted automobiles. Matter of fact, Henry Ford was at one of these races, and I, I'm pretty sure when he saw all the enthusiasm that he said, you know what, I can make a car for the masses now, too. I think it was one of his influences. So the infrastructure in our cities and towns, all because somebody loved cars. Exactly right. Well, I would love to hear this one run. Well, let's go for a ride. When that engine fired, I knew exactly why they called it the Black Beast. We left Howard's garage and toured parts of the original race course. 